watching, excuse me. The government raises interest rates twice in one day to 15% in its all-out battle to prop up sterling. But after a frantic day's trading, the pound plunges again. Today has been an extremely difficult and turbulent day. George Soros made a billion dollars almost overnight. This is the infamous Black Wednesday of 1992. Losing 3.5 billions, the Bank of England is in defeat. At the hands of George Soros. What's it like to have a lot of money? It gives you a degree of freedom. And it also gives you a degree of power. We all need to wake up to who George Soros is and how big his organization is. The major takedown of George Soros is in process. George Soros is one of the richest men in the world. He would be blamed for the financial collapses in Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Japan, and Russia. George Soros' childhood is anything but normal. His father, Tevedar Soros, was a prisoner of war during World War I and spent three years on the run in Siberia. By the time his second son, George Soros, is born in 1930, his built a successful career as a lawyer in Budapest. Well, he was a prisoner of war in Russia, right. and he escaped, and he lived through the Russian Revolution and he came back from that a changed man. Tivadar spent a great deal of time teaching George about the art of survival. I mean, he went through a horrendous experience, and that taught him a lesson which then came in very useful. He, in turn, uh, taught me a lesson which came in useful to me. His father's pragmatism and survival instinct will be the building blocks for his success later in life. But the peace and prosperity his family enjoys is short-lived. Wenn es dem internationalen Finanzjudentum in und außerhalb Europas gelingen sollte, die Völker noch einmal in einen Weltkrieg zu stürzen, dann wird das Ergebnis nicht die Bolschewisierung der Erde und damit der Sieg des Judentums sein, sondern die Vernichtung der jüdischen Rasse in Europa. I think Hitler is uniquely the most genocidally evil dictator that there ever was, and fundamentally he was going to kill as many people who were outside of his master race principle as he possibly could. And he did. Hitler's conquest had wiped out millions of Jews in Western Europe. His next target is Hungary, a country housing the largest Jewish population in Eastern Europe. Nazi authorities start distributing deportation notice to local Jews. But such a deportation notice is a death sentence in disguise. The young George Soros is asked by the Nazi authorities to deliver the notice to the Jewish community. Having suffered the worst of war, Soros' father is determined to survive again by any means necessary. Basically, uh, that there are times when the normal rules don't apply. You see, the way you've looked at the world is just not applicable because the world has changed. So he sold his real estate holdings and starts hiding his family in different locations around the country, under false identities and by bribing authorities. By the time Nazis retreated from Hungary, all the Jewish children of Soros' age are severely traumatized. Some even bring handguns to the classrooms, but not George Soros. He finds the whole experience of the war during 1944 thrilling. It's obvious now that Soros may have a different personality than most. 
people like him thrive by taking huge risks and is a common characteristic of many great traders. But Sorrow's happiness is only temporary. After one evil is defeated, a worse one has taken its place. The occupation by Russians will forever scar Sorrow's family. Suddenly two Russian soldiers stepped in front of us and they laid me down the one step in front of my head with his weapon. They raped me, two of them. And that's how it happened. After that, Sorrels is never the same. He's deeply troubled and starts questioning the nature of reality. You're going to see very likely the um, many of the patterns you'd see in ongoing CPTSD. Okay. That there'll be emotional numbing, that there'll be a, a fear and a confusion about close relationships. It's not unusual to see dissociative symptoms. And dissociation is when a person almost breaks away. It's as though they break away from their own reality or break away from themselves. It's, they're not almost, they're not present in the situation anymore. They've gone someplace else. The young George is desperately trying to break away from this unforgiving chaos of life. After his 17th birthday, he leaves his family behind and embarks on a journey to the West. By the time Soros arrives in London, he is penniless. To make ends meet, he becomes a waiter and saves money by eating leftovers from customers. After all the suffering Soros has endured, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. He's accepted to the London School of Economics. London School of Economics is perhaps the best school to study economics, but what really made this school special was the amount of world leaders it has created. But initially, Sorrels is a loner thrown into the world of unknowns. The only thing that he can do is to devote all of his time to his coursework. He studied under the famous philosopher Karl Popper. So I think Popper was, was a, a genuine contribution to our understanding of what we're doing. His problem was to discriminate between Einstein on the one hand and Marx and Freud on the other. As far as he was concerned, Marx and Freud were sort of pseudoscience and Einstein was real science, but the question is, what was the difference? And it was his notion of the concept of falsifiability. Soros finds Popper's ideas intriguing. I was very much influenced by Karl Popper, who taught me that that perfect knowledge is not attainable. We all act on the basis of a, an imperfect understanding of reality. While before Soros was aimless, now he finds his mission in life, becoming a philosopher, just like his mentor, Karl Popper. But Soros quickly finds out that there is no way he can afford a graduate school. The shortage of money was very serious. It was very important for me to make a living. I developed my philosophy in college while I was also earning my way uh, through college by working in various jobs. For instance, I had a, as a waiter in a nightclub while I was studying during the day. He needs to make a living fast. Upon graduation, he senses there's a good money to be made in finance. He was really taking the initiatives. He wrote a letter to every managing director of every bank in London, hoping to find a job. It worked. A merchant bank offers him a job as a trainee. He happily accepts it. He works as a trader, specializing in gold stock arbitrage, trying to take advantage of the price discrepancies in different markets. But he's a terrible at the job. In just two years, he quits. After World War II, the U.S. emerged as the most powerful nation on the planet. The economy overall grew by 37% during the 1950s. Thanks to Eisenhower's administration, inflation was low and so was the unemployment rate. People around the world are eager to come here to pursue their American dream. Soros is one of them. In 1956, he moved to New York City, working as an arbitrage trader for several financial firms. 
I had a very modest ambition. I just wanted to five years in America mm. and earn at the time, I said, a hundred thousand dollars. <laughs> and then I could live on the, on the income from that. American industry has grown with prodigious speed to its immense size of today. And the capital to build the nation from a raw frontier to the greatest industrial giant in the world but he struggles to find an edge in the industry. The job of arbitrage trader makes Soros think about how different assets relate to each other. At the time, very few investors thought about world finance as an interconnected system. But Soros was one of the first to have that sort of system view. Soros is going to find a new approach to investing. Although he was educated as an economist, he finds classical economic ideas not useful at all in the real world. My interpretation of financial markets directly contradicts the efficient market hypothesis, which has been the prevailing theory uh, about financial markets. That theory claims that markets tend towards equilibrium. Deviations occur in a random fashion and can be attributed to extraneous shocks. If that theory is valid, Mine is false, and vice versa. Instead, Soros finds out that the real world of finance resembles that of a chaotic system. Almost any human enterprise is inevitably driven by two forces, reality and the expectation by the participants. They are interdependent, but since human perceptions are biased and flawed, there will always be a gap. Such a gap represents trading opportunities. Soros probably didn't know at the time his theory of reflexivity resembles that of a chaos theory. Without a doubt, chaos is the natural state of affairs of human beings. If I'm afraid of um, being mugged in New York City walking down the street, I will become very, very cautious. As I become cautious, I become a target. Therefore, I am inviting the very thing that I'm afraid of. Soros believes that our reality is more dynamic and chaotic than what people believe. Their biased perception of reality will cause them to behave irrationally, creating an opportunity for him to exploit. Soros' insight puts him 10 steps ahead of everyone else on Wall Street. By 1969, he had saved $250,000 for himself as a trader. But to test his theory, he needs a larger sum of money. That is not a small amount for someone living in the 1960s, but still not enough to start his fund. But over the years as a trader, Soros has built a strong relationship with many wealthy European investors. They put up $6 million into Soros' funds. He has a simple investing proposition, looking for a reflective boom-bust trend, riding it on the way up and shorting it on the way down. His timing couldn't be more perfect. In 1969, Real Estate Investment Trust was a new hot investment vehicle. Uh, REITs have proven themselves to be an attractive method by which investors can own commercial real estate. Soros recognizes that this new asset class will likely experience a boom-bust cycle. He predicts that it will crash in three years. But before it actually happens, it will keep going up. To write this trend, he starts heavily buying REITs. Soros is a speculator. He buys these real estate trusts not because he likes properties, but simply because he sees an opportunity to cash in. Soros is right. He makes $1 million on the way up, but he makes even more money by shorting them when his predictions come true three years later. Soros' hedge fund nearly doubles every year, managing $50 million by 1973. One of the shocking traits of Soros' investment style is that he doesn't bet as often as a day trader, but when he does make a bet, it's usually very large, sometimes risking his entire portfolio. But his fund soon grows larger than what one man can handle. He needs to find a partner, someone who can operate at his level. Jim Rogers seems like the most unlikely partner for George Soros. Raised in Demopolis, Alabama, Jim Rogers grew up during a bumpy time in the American South. A brilliant student, 
Jim Rogers spent his college years in Oxford, studying politics, economics, and philosophy. Like Soros, Rogers has more of a global view of the financial market, meaning that he thinks about the world markets as an interconnected system, with each element affecting the other. This very much resembles Soros' thinking. Now what does this mean for you? Your dollar will be worth just as much tomorrow as it is today. After Nixon broke the U.S. tradition by attaching U.S. dollars to gold, the financial market is never the same. And by 1971, it was clear the dollar could no longer be exchanged into gold, and that began the modern age of inflation. By 1972, Soros and Rogers sensed that there will be a structural change in the banking industry that no one has caught on. Banking industry before the 1980s was very regulated, and it wasn't very cool to become a banker. At the beginning of the 1970s, the American banking system was still frozen into immob immobility. The industry was highly fragmented and regimented. A dull business attracted dull people who were more concerned with job security than with profits. Bank shares were traded by appointment, but I detected some signs of life. With easy money flowing into the market, Soros realizes that the banking sector is set to boom. He instructs his traders to buy as many shares as possible in major banks, generating 50% profit in less than a year. Some banks were poised to embark on balanced growth by equity leveraging, i.e. selling shares at a premium. The bouquet of shares, of bank shares I recommended did in fact rise by some 50% in that year. While the 70s has been a difficult period for America, Soros made more money than anyone in finance. He's truly the pioneer in macro investing. In 1970s, he invests in Japanese, Dutch, and French stocks. And at some point, he put one third of his portfolio in Japanese stocks, which doubled in a year. In the first decade of his fund, it went up 3,000%, an unparalleled feat on Wall Street. By 1980, Soros' fund has $381 million under management. He renamed his fund to Quantum Fund, reflecting the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics. As a child, Soros fantasized about being a god. I did have juvenile fantasies of saving the world. So I had that the sort of what I called messianic fantasies, which I think most adolescents have. I've been somewhat more successful of actually acting out those fantasies. To Soros, his track record shows that he may indeed be special. He's able to see how the world works better than anyone. But the market is about to humble his oversized ego. The 1970s will forever be known as the decade of soaring inflations. The Fed tried to intervene in 1973 by raising interest rates, but it created a mass unemployment. By the beginning of 1979, inflation jumped 8% from the year before. At the same time, the US dollar is losing its value fast. Finally, Fed Chairman Paul Volcker decides that inflation must come down, even at the cost of creating unemployment. You know, you can't deal with that problem by simply saying we're going to let inflation go ahead. While most investors see hyperinflation as a bad thing, but Soros sees it as an opportunity. Similarly, right now in US, inflation has gotten to a 32-year high. But most people don't know about one asset class that has performed well during hyperinflation throughout history. It is contemporary arts. Contemporary art prices appreciated by 23.2% versus 3.8% for the S&P 500 during periods of 3% inflation or higher, which is right now. Most people see contemporary art as something nice to hang on the wall. But billionaires like Soros see them as a great place to store and grow wealth. Why? It is because contemporary art has outpaced the S&P 500 from 1995 to 2020. For example, if you look at the Rockefellers, they amass more art collections than anyone. Right now, you can become an art investor like Soros, Larry Fink, and me with a new app called Masterworks.io. 
Masterworks allows anyone to invest in multi-million dollar paintings by famous artists like Warhol, Banksy, and Picasso, just like picking stocks online. And they recently raised $110 million in Series A funding at a valuation of over $1 billion. So you know that this market has a ton of potential. This is how it works. Masterworks will buy a physical painting, securitize it with SEC, and issue shares representing an investment on their app. That way you know that it is an SEC approved investment and it is safe. The securitization process also let you invest in paintings by Picasso and Banksy for a fraction of the original cost, instead of spending millions of dollars. You can either hold your shares until Masterworks sells the painting or sell to other Masterworks members on their platform. Once they sell the painting, they will give you your share of the profit. For example, Masterworks investors saw a 32% analyzed appreciation from the sale of their Banksy painting, net of fees, which almost doubled the return of S&P 500. And in 2021, investors are set to receive a 31% analyzed appreciation from the sale of their George Condo painting. I'm a proud investor in Basquiat on Masterworks platform, and I invite you to join me. Through the link in the description, my viewers can skip the wait list and invest alongside me and other billionaires in a few clicks. Soros is certain that Polk Volcker's action will spell doom to the U.S. economy. The way the Fed increases the interest rate is by selling the treasury bills at the market, sometimes at a lower price. Thus, the interest rate will increase. Soros is expecting an inverted yield curve to happen. An inverted yield curve happens when there's a stronger demand for long-term bonds versus short-term bonds and stocks. That's exactly what Soros expects to happen. So he goes long on long-term bonds and so short of stocks and short-term bonds. But his timing is wrong. The economy, however, remains strong far longer than he anticipated. When Soros' prediction doesn't happen in time, his fund loses $80 million in 1980. This is his first major loss. I think it hurt him deeply. And also teach him a lesson about the business of running a hedge fund. After losing 22%, in 1980, half of his investors cashed out. As an expert in boom and bust, he realizes that this may be the end for him, and it's time to retire. Due to a disappointing year in 1980, George Soros semi-retires and marries his second wife, the 28-year-old Susan Weber. He left Quantum Fund at the hands of his replacement, Jane Marcus. Jim Marcus was a 33-year-old mutual fund manager who made 69% return in 1982. Soros Fund has a massive comeback in 1982, generating 56.9%. He believes that Marcus will continue this track record in the years to come. While in 1983, Quantum Fund was up 25%, it only achieved a 9% gain the year later. To Soros and his investors, it is a big embarrassment. He now believes perhaps no one can be as good as he is. By the end of 1984, he comes back after three years of retirement. The highest order of business before the nation is to restore our economic prosperity. Reagan's principles were number one, lower marginal tax rates. Number two, deregulate. Number three, hold down government spending. Number four, follow a monetary policy that will bring you low, in, low inflation. The way Reagan wanted to keep a low inflation is by having a strong dollar. That means the U.S. can import cheaper goods. Thus, the price level will decrease. But Soros has a different idea. In the wake of Reagan's high spending, no taxing policies from the early 1980s, the United States, Soros believes, is heading for a depression. By 1985, Soros has come back from his retirement. He sees Reagan's policy on keeping a strong dollar a disaster for America, but also a great opportunity for him to cash in. He goes long on the Japanese yen and Deutsche Mark, while shorting US dollar and crude oil. His prediction starts to materialize on September 22, 1985. The central banks around the world start pushing the dollar down. By late October, the dollar falls 13% against yen, and a year later, 25%. Altogether, Soros made $150 million profits, a shocking 122% return. To make profits in currencies, Soros had to borrow a lot of money, sometimes using 10 times leverage. 
The danger is that if the market goes against him, it can literally destroy him. After making large profits in 1986, Soros believes that his doomsday prediction is temporarily delayed. So he goes on a buying spree of US equities, hoping to catch one last ride before it crashes. But his timing is wrong, again. The Dow could not be saved even by falling long and short-term interest rates, and closed with a loss just shy of 300 points at 1950.76. The Black Monday crash caught Soros by surprise. He's trapped in a liquidity squeeze. The predator is now a prey. When Soros was dumping his assets in the market, all the traders sensed that a big whale was in trouble. So everyone just waited. So Soros was able to sell his S&P futures at a price level of 195. But when the market closes, it goes right back to 240. So he was clearly taken advantage by Wall Street traders. And in fact, the crash wiped out Soros' entire profit for 1987. Soros was right about the crash, but was dead wrong about the sequence of events that happened. After taking a loss in October, Soros' other investment came into fruition, generating a 14% overall return for that year. The 1987 crash makes Soros once again want to retire. So then, about uh, 15 years, let's say, later, I started thinking, why should I keep kill myself uh, making money? Soros' investment strategy is very nerve-wracking, to say the least. And as people grow older, the risk-taking tendency tends to decrease. I was walking on the street from one bank to another trying to make the arrangement, and I thought I was going to have a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized this tension to make money is really not worth it if it's going to kill me. That's when I decided to actually change course, when I decided to actually to turn to philanthropy. Without audacious risk-taking, Soros knows his fund's performance will suffer. To retire in peace and to maintain the fund's performance, Soros needs to find a younger version of himself to take his place. By the fall of 1988, he found his man. Like Soros, Stanley Druckenmiller has a humble beginning. He grew up in a single-parent family. He didn't go to any fancy Ivy League college. And in fact, to make money, he had to open a hot dog stand on campus. Druckenmiller's career takes off immediately after graduation. By 1988, his strategic aggressive investing fund becomes the highest performing fund in the industry. Druckenmiller was an admirer of Soros long before they met. They're very similar in a lot of ways. Both have a big disregard for academic finance, and they're all big picture thinkers and are also very practical. After spending one year mentoring Druckenmiller, Soros finally given the full reign of Quantum Fund. Up until that point, I had a very good record, but it was only after I was with George that I learned how much you should really press a bet when your confidence level is extremely high. I did fine well before I was there, don't get me wrong, but, yeah. but it was amazing to watch that man when we had something we really believed in, um, to, to see the way he would, he would size risk and reward. After retirement, Soros starts spending most of his time with his charity. I started out with a framework that I really developed as a student when I was influenced by Karl Popper, right. Open Society and Its Enemies. And I set up a foundation uh, to foster the, uh, open societies. The fund's performance has actually gotten better after he left. So people speculate that Soros uses a charity to get access to world leaders in order to have a better information about the world economy. But really, the stellar returns of Quantum Fund after 1990 is all because of one man, Druckenmiller. 